The Signal Oil Program. Yes, the Signal Oil Program. The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal gasoline is tops, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies independently operated Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Death of Mr. Penny. On the icy slope, high above Clear Valley Ski Lodge, the two people, racing down together side by side, appeared like two moving specks of black against a sea of white. To the little man who had his field glasses carefully trained upon them, the picture was far more complete. He saw a very handsome couple, the woman fresh, radiant, and wholesome, the man tall, athletic. And as they swung to a stop at the end of the ski slope, their happiness with each other seemed very apparent. Yes, Mr. and Mrs. Frederick Eklund seemed perfectly matched. The little man with the field glasses could not help but marvel at the strange course of true love. How it could so neatly bridge the gap between the fact of Mrs. Eklund's almost fabulous wealth and the modest means of Mr. Eklund, the mere ski instructor. And the little man had to admit that the two were getting along famously. <laughs> Oh, darling, you're wonderful. Your favorite ski instructor? <laughs> my favorite ski instructor. Oh. Well, then you'll accept my criticisms a little more graciously, <laughs> Mrs. E. <laughs> At last, Christie was bad. Fine way to turn an ankle. And be carried home by the tall, bronzed instructor. I think I'll do it. I think you won't. <laughs> We're heading back to the lodge right now. <laughs> All right, darling, whatever you say. <sighs> but, um, I've still got that headache. Barbara. Yes? Something on your mind... It was so quiet up there on the slope just before we came down. Quiet? Just taking time to tell myself I'm not in a dream. That we're really together. Married. And so happy. Are you sure that's all? I'm sure that's all. And the headache can either be cured or made worse by a dry martini. Shall we go take the gamble? Oh, you don't have to suggest that twice. <laughs> I wonder if you'll always be such an agreeable man. Yeah, as long as I'm thirsty. Let's go. An agreeable man. Yes, Fred, you've been that with Barbara, haven't you? That and more. And you know that she appreciates it. That you've made her very happy. But you also know that there is something disturbing her this afternoon. Something more than a simple headache. You worry about it yourself. Bring it up again as the two of you sit by the roaring fire of the lodge and look out at the landscape through a giant picture window. You, uh, still don't feel any better, dear? No. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go upstairs, nap for a couple of hours before dinner. Mind? You know I don't. What will you do to amuse yourself? Oh, look at the scenery. Well, it's not novel enough. You know it too well. <laughs> oh, no. I see something different every time I look out the window. Here. Here, I'll mm. prove it. Did you ever see anything like that? <laughs> oh, I don't see what... Yeah. You mean that little man on the terrace? Uh-huh. The one with the field glasses. Looks like an African explorer. Now, you can't say I see anything like that every day. No, uh, but I, I didn't mean people. I... Frederick, I... 
If you don't mind, I'm going upstairs right now. Oh, but you haven't finished I'm your... sorry, darling. I don't want my drink. Oh. Well, I'll go up with you, dear. No, huh? please. I... Uh, Frederick, hmm? you could do something for me. That new book I want. The manager said they have it in the village now. Oh, I'll Wait. drive right down. I'll get it for you, dear. Glad to. But uh, are you sure you're all right? Oh, I will be. Just give me an hour. I'll be bright as a new penny. Bright as a dollar. Uh, by dinner time. <laughs> Sounds worth waiting for. Go ahead, darling. Thanks, darling. You watch Barbara turn away, go to the stairs. A moment later, you get up, start outside as if to get the car. But at the end of the terrace, you stop and wait a moment. He goes right inside, doesn't he, Fred? The funny little man that Barbara didn't want to look at. You walk back and see him hurry up the stairs after her. Ten minutes later, he's back down, heading toward the cocktail lounge. You walk in casually and slide into the booth beside him. Well, Mr. Penny, it's going very well. You got it? I did. Five thousand, as usual. Mm. I was a little worried this afternoon. Thought Barbara might have guessed something. About you? Mm-hmm. But I was wrong. Of course. Oh, Barbara threatened me today. She said that this must be the last payment. She's convinced that you'd be quite understanding about those letters. Oh, i will have to take a different tack. Yes, or spoil the act. Oh, they're really nothing, you know. The letters, she just feels that you'd be very hurt if you ever knew there'd been another man in her life once a married man. <laughs> <laughs> I hurt. <laughs> uh, you know, Freddie, you are the odd one. Long as I've known you, I always marvel. What is it that keeps you from simply presenting your case to these women, demanding all the money you want? Obviously, my dear Penny, you'll never know women. There are things that cannot be told. One of the things is that love alone is not sufficient to hold their man. You're right, I suppose. Well, I've always left that part of it to you. Yeah, and let's keep it that way, huh? I'll take care of the romancing. You stick with the business end of the deal. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll take my half of the money now. To be sure, Freddy. To be sure. As you conclude your present business with Mr. Penny, he excuses himself and hurries away. A moment later, you're conscious of the voice, the song that comes from the large dining hall. Monday, maybe Monday. Susan, a delightful girl, isn't she, Fred? Talented and beautiful. Yes, and since you met her a month ago, she's been quite overwhelmed by your charm. You stroll across the lobby and stand there at the entrance of the dining hall and watch her as she sings. He'll build a little home. She's beautiful, isn't she? Hmm? Oh, Penny, I thought you were leaving. I'm going in to have dinner. Now, look, Penny, Barbara will be coming down soon. She isn't pleasant to be with when you're around. Uh... Your wife is resting, Freddie. She won't be down for some time. But, shh, I want to listen. And so all else above, I'm waiting for the man That was wonderful, wonderful. Oh, Susan sings beautifully, does she not, Freddie, my boy? Mm-hmm. She's, um, quite a girl. Quite a girl. Yes. Another one of your many side interests. You've always had them, haven't you? <laughs> Frankie, my boy, let us go out on the terrace for a moment. I want to talk to you. Come along. The idea we've already talked everything out? No, not quite, my boy. After you... All right, what's on your mind, Penny? Susan, I want to speak to you about Susan. Oh? You're quite interested in her, aren't you? Oh, I don't know. Just for laughs, maybe. Oh, I see. Then you won't mind if I ask you to stay away from her. To stay away? You're asking me... <laughs> Wait a minute, Penny. You don't mean that you... <laughs> you find it amusing, my boy. <laughs> Why, she wouldn't even look at you. <laughs> Oh, but, Freddy, wonderful. she has many times, so often that I don't want you to see her anymore. <laughs> oh, just like that, huh? <laughs> just what do you do if I ignore your advice, lover boy? Oh, I could make things rather unpleasant for you. Really, I could. Really? Like what? Oh, tell your wife that you're my business partner. That we're blackmailing her together. You know what I'd do? No, what would you do, Freddy? I tell her you forced me into it a trick. I was only playing along with you until I saw my chance to turn you over to the police. Barbara is very much in love with me, Penny. She'd believe it. Yes, yes, I suppose she would. Well, in that case, I should have to tell her about the Carson widow. 
the incident at Sun Valley two years ago. What? That the police are interested in finding the man who went skiing with a Carson woman the morning she was killed. Accidentally. Now, wait a minute, Penny. I could tell your wife what really happened, Freddy. So be a good boy and stay away from Susan, eh? With the prologue of Death of Mr. Penny, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. Here in Hollywood, where The Whistler is produced, this is the week when the movie folks decide who's going to win the coveted Oscars. <laughs> it's too bad there isn't an Oscar for gasoline, because I'm sure that Signal Gasoline would run away with the honors for outstanding performance. Just as some actors become typed in certain roles, you may have typed Signal Gasoline for economy because of its reputation as the go-farther gasoline. But economy, mind you, is only half of Signal's story. You see, the thing which makes Signal's good mileage possible, the extra efficiency today's Signal Gasoline coaxes from your motor, also makes Signal the logical choice for more dramatic performances, calling for instant starting, flashing pickup, or smooth, effortless power. So, if you want your car to perform as if it had just won an Oscar, just you keep these two points in mind the next time you buy gasoline. One, it takes extra quality to go farther. And two, Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. came as a shock, didn't it, Fred? Mr. Penny's warning. And you wonder if your odd little partner really means to carry out his threat, to make trouble for you if you continue to see Susan. He could make things quite difficult, reviving the Carson incident at this time. It would never do if your wife Barbara found out about that, would it? But in the days that follow, you decide to risk it, to test Mr. Penny's threat. And then one evening at the lodge, as you sit in the cocktail lounge with Barbara... Uh, Fred? Yes, dear? Uh, did you happen to run over to Shellville the night before last? Shellville? Why, no. Uh, Betty mentioned it this afternoon. Uh, she and Greg thought they saw you there. No, no, they were mistaken. Oh, I did go down to the village here. That's the night I ran into Higby, an old friend of mine. You remember, darling, I called you. Told you I'd be late getting back? Yes, I know. As a matter of fact, Higby and I spent most of the evening at the Buckhorn Cafe talking over old times. Uh, See here, Barbara, you don't think I'd... I'd lie? Well, of course not, darling. You know how Betty is, wrong as usual. Um, see if you can get the waiter, will you, dear? I think I'd like another brandy before turning in. Oh, Freddy, my boy. I could say that this is a pleasant surprise, but it isn't really. I've been expecting you. Can I come in? Well, I was about to retire, but... Thanks. I won't take up too much of your time. Oh, no hurry. Fix yourself a drink, my boy. Thanks again. Oh, none for me. I have my glass of milk, you see. <clears throat> well, here's to you, Penny. The winner. Oh? It's all yours. Susan, I mean. I'll stay away. Oh, good, good. You, uh, you told Barbara you saw me in Shellville the other night, didn't you? Did I? Yeah, it was just a warning, just in case I had any ideas about not playing ball, huh? Well, I could have told her you were with Susan, but, uh, I didn't. Thanks, thanks. It was big of you. I thought so. However, Freddy, my boy, if you insist... I know, I know. I'll stay away from Susan. It's all settled. Uh, settled? No, no, not quite. I've been thinking, Freddy, my boy. What about? The money we collect from your wife. 5000 every three months. Well, it doesn't seem worthwhile. Now, wait a minute. I wouldn't push Barbara too hard. Well, 2000 more isn't such a push. Yeah, but there might be trouble. I wouldn't try. Let's leave it the way it is, huh? 5000 is good enough. Well, perhaps, but uh, when one has to split it two ways... I said it's enough. For you, perhaps, but not for me. Yes, I've been thinking, Freddy. I've been thinking I should dissolve our little partnership. What? Yes. I think that from now on, I shall keep all the money. Wait a minute. I'm the one who gave you Barbara's letters in the first place. So 
So what? You think I'll hold still for you cutting me out? But, my boy, there's nothing you can do about it. Because of Sun Valley, Mrs. Carson... Why, you... Oh, oh, please don't get excited. I ought to wring your scrawny little neck. But you will not. You will do nothing. Now, please, go. I'm quite tired. Good night, Freddy. <laughs> For a moment, you stand there, staring at the little man. You watch him as he calmly drops a sleeping capsule into the glass of milk. As he raises it to his lips, he smiles at you. And you know he has you at his mercy, don't you, Fred? You whirl and rush out into the corridor. And as you hurry back to your room, the rage within you mounts with each step. Yes, Mr. Penny has complete control of the situation for the present. But you're not going to let him get away with it, are you? No, the money he gets from your wife means too much to you. And you know that somehow you're going to get rid of Mr. Penny and the threat he holds over you. It isn't until the following afternoon that you know just how you're going to do it. On an errand for Barbara, you stop at the village drugstore, Pop Grandin's place. That be all, Freddy? Yeah, I guess so, Pop. Okay, Oh, say, uh, you going back up the lodge? Yeah, why? I wonder if you'd mind dropping off a prescription for me. Oh, of course not. You can just drop it off the desk. Come on back. I'll make it up right away. Hmm? You walk with Pop Grand into the back of the shop. Watch him as he prepares a prescription. Then your eyes wander over the shelves lined with bottles. At the far end of the lower shelf, you see a bottle filled with tiny red capsules. Just like the one you saw Mr. Penny drop into the glass of milk last night. Oh, dreaded that telephone. Eh, excuse me, will you, Freddy? Hmm? Oh, sure, sure. I never saw it to feel. Every time I get back here, that doggone... Couldn't have picked a better time. As you take the bottle down off the shelf, the idea hits you, doesn't it? Yes, this could be the way, couldn't it, Fred? Quickly, you unscrew the cap, drop a capsule into your pocket, and replace the bottle... Then your eyes skip along the shelf and finally stop on a small bottle filled with white powder marked poison. Deadly poison, Fred. Uh, sorry to be so long, Freddy. That was Mrs. Ferguson, and you know how she is. Talk, 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 talk. Yeah. Now, where was I? The prescription. Oh, yes, yes. Well, that'll only be a minute, Freddy. Sure nice of you to do this little favor for me. Not at all, Pop. Not at all. It's a pleasure. You're thankful that Barbara is out when you return to your room at the lodge. Quickly, you empty the contents of the red capsule into the wash basin. Then you fill the capsule with a white powder you took from the shelf at Grandin's drugstore. Moments later, you leave the room, the capsule containing the deadly poison safely tucked away in your pocket. Early that evening, you pay another call on Mr. Penny. Oh, come in, Freddie, my boy. Come in. Thanks. I'm going out shortly. You don't mind if I finish shaving, do you? No, no. Go ahead. Uh, make yourself at home, my boy. Fix yourself a drink. Thanks. I'll skip this one. As you wish. Now tell me, to what do I owe the honor of this visit? Well, I, uh, I, I, I thought maybe you'd reconsider. <laughs> what? After the way you double-crossed me with Susan? Not a chance, my boy. Not a chance. I'd, uh, I'd take a smaller cut. And as a matter of fact, I've been seriously thinking of asking your wife for more money. I told you before, that would be a mistake. She won't pay it. We shall see. We shall see. What are you doing, Freddy? Hmm? Oh, just looking at this magazine on your nightstand. Holidays, huh? Planning a trip? Perhaps. Oh, look, Penny, I need the money. Why can't we make some sort of arrangement? You're wasting your time, my boy. This is too good a thing for me to share with anyone. I am rather surprised and annoyed, too, that I didn't think of handling the matter this way long ago. You, uh... You, you won't change your mind? No. After all, you still have Barbara. She's a wealthy woman. Do you begrudge me a few thousand dollars now and then? All right. That's the way you want it. Yes, that's the way I want it, my boy. Good night. Good night. Uh, no hard feelings, Freddy. No. See you in the morning, then. Yeah. Maybe you will, Penny. 
and maybe not. It's done, isn't it, Fred? There were only four capsules in the box. You replaced one with a capsule containing the deadly poison. And now all you can do is wait. And you know it won't be long, for Mr. Penny takes a sleeping capsule every night. You're a little disappointed the following morning at breakfast when you see Mr. Penny sitting at his usual table. It was a little too much to hope for, wasn't it, Fred? That he'd take the poison capsule the first night. But then there are only three capsules in the box now. The next morning, you're in for another disappointment. For as you enter the dining hall, you see Mr. Penny again, sitting at the table near the window. He looks up as you and Barbara seat yourself only a few tables away. He smiles, nods, then returns to his morning paper. And then something that Barbara says startles you. Only two left, Frederick. What? Only two empty tables left. I'm glad we came down to breakfast when we did. I hate to wait. Oh. Oh, Oh, yes, yes. Oh, goodness, darling. You jumped so. Something wrong? Uh, No. No, no, of course not. I I, I had my mind on something else. Yes. You were thinking of the capsules in the box, weren't you, Fred? There are only two left now, and it's an even money bet. However, the following morning when you arrive at the dining hall, Mr. Penny is absent. It's almost 11 o'clock when you and Barbara leave your table, and there's been no sign of him. You're sure he's dead, and you're free at last, aren't you, Fred? Yes. With Mr. Penny out of the way, the Sun Valley incident is closed. It'll be a simple matter with your connection to find someone more trustworthy than Penny to do your blackmailing. As Barbara hurries upstairs for her scarf, the desk clerk calls out to you. Oh, uh, Mr. Eckland. Yes? What is it? A message for you, sir, this envelope. Oh, thank you. For a moment, you're puzzled. Stare at the envelope. Then you rip it open. And suddenly an icy hand closes around your heart as a tiny red capsule tumbles out of the envelope into the palm of your hand. Penny has known all along, hasn't he, Fred? He must have watched you in the mirror when he was shaving saw you place the poison capsule in the box. A cold wave of fear sweeps over you as you realize what he'll do now. Your first thought is for you and Barbara to get away. You hurry to your room upstairs, and as you're about to open the door, you hear Barbara's voice. Well, yes. Yes, whatever you say. What? No, not here. I'll meet you at the point. Inspiration point. Tonight. Yes. Nine o'clock, Mr. Penny. Mr. Penny isn't wasting any time getting his revenge, is he, Fred? Your first thought is to get away, and then suddenly you realize it's useless to run. He'd find you and Barbara sooner or later. No, you've got to take care of him now, once and for all. And this time, you can't afford to miss. That night, you're standing in the shadows of the fir trees near the point. You see Barbara hurrying up the path. Mr. Penny is not far behind. Hello, Penny. What? Oh, oh, it's you, Freddy. What are you doing here? I could ask you the same thing, but I know what you're doing here. Too bad you'll never keep that appointment with my wife, Penny. What? Take a look down there. It's an awful drop, isn't it? What are you... What are you going to do? You're a smart little operator, Penny. You ought to be able to figure that out. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. When you passed a signal service station during the past few days, you may have noticed the picture of the happy bluebird on the sign outside. Well, Mr. Bluebird is there to remind you that if you want your motor to sing this spring, you'll be wise to make your next oil change a change to the improved type signal oil that does so much more than just lubricate. Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil. Naturally, Signal Premium has 100% pure paraffin base, the finest lubricant known. But in addition, 
Signal Premium contains scientific new compounds that protect your motor in ways no regular oil alone can do. For instance, one compound in Signal Premium compounded motor oil actually cleanses your motor of carbon, gum, and varnish. A second compound in Signal Premium protects costly bearings from corrosion. And still other compounds do other important jobs to keep your motor happy as a bluebird. Good reason, I'd say, to make your spring oil change a change to Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil. Sold only at Signal Service Station. It's all over, isn't it, Fred? Mr. Penny is out of the way at last. The threat he held over you is gone, and now you're free. Back at the village, the Buckhorn Cafe, you spend the next several hours chatting with old friends, and then shortly after midnight, you return to the lodge to your room. As you enter, you're surprised to see Barbara pacing up and down. Oh, Fred, where have you been? At the village, dear. I told you I Fred, had to... did you hear about it? The accident? Oh, the man who fell off the cliffs, yeah. They were talking about it in the lobby when I came in. Matter of fact, the sheriff is down there now talking to the manager. The man's name was Penny. You knew him? Yes. He was blackmailing me, Fred. What? He, he came to me about a year ago with some letters I'd written. Foolish letters. He wanted $5,000 for each one. I, I laughed at him. They meant nothing to me. and I threatened to call the police. You, you threatened? Yes, I, I threatened to. Then Mr. Penny showed me some other letters. A woman's letter. Mrs. Carson. Mrs. Mrs. Carson? Her letters to you, Fred. When you're at Sun Valley. You said the police would be anxious to see them. I, I couldn't believe you'd done anything wrong. But then when he said... He'd send the letters to the Idaho police... I, <laughs> I was afraid. He's been blackmailing you all this time because of those letters to me? <laughs> Yes. Barbara, listen to me. I've got... It's not true, is it, Fred? The skiing accident. You didn't kill it, did you? He told you that? This morning, yes. He called me on the phone, told me he could prove it, that you'd killed him. Made it look like an accident. That's not true. Oh. Oh. Then he was lying. Oh, I knew it, darling. I knew it all along. But I agreed to meet him at the point tonight. He, he said he'd bring all the proof I needed. Letters, documents, all the evidence. He... He had all that with him tonight? Yes. But he never arrived. He fell off the cliff on the way. Yeah. Yeah, he fell off the cliff. Oh, darling, darling. I'm so glad Mr. Penny was lying. If he'd had any evidence on him, the police certainly would have discovered it when they found his body. Wouldn't they? Yeah. Yeah, I guess they would. I'll, uh, I'll go, Barbara. I'm sure it's for me. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Featured in tonight's story were Gerald Moore, Dorothy Lovett, and Jeff Corey. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen, directed by Gordon T. Hughes, with story by Joel Malone and Adrian John Doe, and music by Wilbur Hatch. All characters portrayed on the Whistler program are fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>